Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our 44th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority New Delhi as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75 week long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking, this, uh, is taking this celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in week 44 of the celebration, with the clouded leopard as the species in focus and the Sephijala Zoological Park as the zoo in focus. So joined in today to speak to us on the species is Dr. Bhaskar Chaudhary. Dr. Bhaskar is a wildlife veterinarian at the Wildlife Trust of India. He has over two decades of experience in the rescue and rehabilitation of animals in different landscapes of India. He has predominantly worked in the northeastern landscape. Apart from this, he is also a member of the IUCN SSE Asian Elephant Specialist Group and the Asian Rhino Specialist Group. He has received various, he has also received various accolades throughout his career for his outstanding contribution in the field of wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. He will speak to us more today on the species in focus. So over to you, sir. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Am I am I audible to you? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Suze Day, for uh, giving the opportunity to uh, share my experiences with these species, one of the charismatic species we have in India. Uh, this is uh, this my talk is about uh, not about the biology and ecology of clouded leopard, but uh, our experiences when we had uh, suddenly got two orphan cubs uh, in the northeastern part of uh, India. In the state of Assam, uh, we uh, hand raised it, uh, but after that, uh, we wanted to, you know, try and uh, make an effort whether we can actually uh, release them back to the wild, which would be really wonderful. And uh, by working with those uh, those two cubs, uh, we also would be knowing a lot about its uh, biology, its behavior etc and that was a unique opportunity and uh, my talk will be about uh, the experience that we had and uh, the results that we got uh, thank you now uh, may i share my screen yes sir please go ahead So the talk is on the rehabilitation of orphan clouded leopards that we undertook in Assam. Uh, so we all know uh, that the clouded leopard is uh, one of the species, which is uh, not actually a big cat, but a smallest of the big cat. And there are a lot uh, of information to the scientific world, which is uh, missing compared to other species of the or other species of carnivores. So it's a charismatic species. It's a fascinating species to know, understand. And uh, we are fortunate in Northeast that these species exist here. Gives an opportunity to, for us to, to know about, uh, about the species. So our, uh, our uh, story began with the uh, sudden uh, rescue of these two cubs in the in the Manas Tiger Reserve area in the western part of Assam. Uh, they weigh about 600 to 700 grams on admission. They were dehydrated. So we our first challenge was to make them live, make them make them survive. And we started using uh, 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 an artificial milk formula. We don't have many choices for carnivores, unlike then in 2014. So we started using human infant formula, in fact, with a 50 to 50% 50 dilution. And they seem to have uh, adapted well. They grew about uh, 40 to 50 grams a day, and uh, we weaned them at the age of two months. 
we wind off them at the age of two months. So this was all happening in the forest division where uh, Mr. S Miss, uh, Mrs. Sonali Ghosh, uh, the um, previous uh, chairperson from the Central Zoo Authority was posted as the DFO in uh, that division. So we had, uh, um, we had uh, um, made up our plan that can we just try and uh, release them back to the wild? Is it possible or let us make a make a try at least uh, to release them back to the wild? That would be wonderful. So under her leadership and uh, our effort, uh, we made that attempt. Uh, we looked at the literatures, whether um, it has been done elsewhere, uh, what was the method and uh, very scanty literatures uh, are available in fact on the species itself. So we had to make our own uh, uh, working protocol and test it on the field. Uh, we had been doing a lot of uh, bear rehabilitation in, in our natural Pradesh of, us, of India. So we had uh, made a protocol of assisted release. Uh, that was the protocol followed that we have been following for uh, orphan bear cubs. So we had some insights from that uh, rehabilitation protocol. We thought that uh, that would be a better method to follow. So in that method, what happens is uh, when uh, uh, an orphan calf lands, uh, lands up at our center, we try to save its life first, nurse it to the age of, uh, age of weaning, and gradually under the guidance of the keeper himself, we make uh, short uh, acclimatization phases inside the uh, release area. So gradually their dependence on the foster parents uh, reduces. And when we see that we can actually withdraw uh, any human uh, intervention at that point of time, we try to collar them and try to only release, uh, only do post-release monitoring hereafter and see the results, whether they are surviving, whether they are uh, able to feed uh, for themselves, whether they are able to avoid uh, predation, and that is how the rehabilitation goes on. So similarly, we uh, did that for the clouded leopards uh, in question. So uh, where do we do it? Uh, ideally, uh, the place where they are rescued, we'd like to try it there, but uh, it was in Manas Tiger Reserve, but we are talking about a tiger reserve, which was one of the most promising tiger reserves in the country, but uh, we had two decade long uh, civil unrest in that area. So uh, there was uh, virtually anarchy in uh, Ras Tiger Reserve at that point of time. Uh, the data in my uh, slides uh, show you how was the situation, not the entire population of 80 to 100 uh, rhinoceros, a uh, lot of Asian elephants, basically a uh, lot of poaching. There was, there was no uh, governance and the forest staff has also been martyred. So it was a total anarchy at that point of time. But luckily in 2002, 2003, some uh, uh, normalcy some uh, was restored. Uh, so at that point of time, Manas was just limping back uh, to uh, normalcy again. And that is at, at that point of time, we started doing all this rehabilitation in Manas. So in a in a ideal site selection, uh, it would be uh, we looked at uh, three major uh, uh, criteria: whether that uh, the species uh, that's a natural range for the species, whether there is enough prey for the species uh, to survive there, what is the proximity, what is the uh, habitat types, is it contiguity uh, to Bhutan? And then the most important is how far it is from the nearest human areas uh, so that in future there is no scope of uh, conflict with the uh, with the fringe villages. So uh, we had done a few studies, few rapid studies on the information that is available in that area. And we, we selected uh, the Ripu Reserve Forest in the within the Manas Tiger Reserve itself as the site for uh, doing the experiment. 
So after winning, they were uh, uh, we we nursed them together. They were growing up together. We uh, started taking them for short acclimatization uh, walks inside the forest area, guided by the keepers. And then at the age of five to six months, we translocated them to the proposed release sites. And at that point of time, they were about eight uh, kgs each, and they were held in a uh, about 16 square kilometer square meters of uh, uh, an uh, iron enclosure. And we had put up that enclosure on a treetop uh, to make it a field that you know uh, to to grow the homing instinct that will be required in future for their survival. So gradually we started taking them out from the enclosures, again escorted by keepers very early morning and late uh, afternoon. Ideally, we would have uh, loved to do that at night, but that is not possible humanly for uh, night acclimatization with these two cups. So we uh, we decided on a crepuscular uh, time for uh, acclimatization for these two cups. We were monitoring the health and uh, we were regularly weighing them you know in the in the slide on the right itself you can see there's a there's a sling that is attached to the cages so that every morning when they jump from their cages we get their uh, body uh, weights and uh, we collected their blood samples for uh, any diseases parasites etc during that uh, phase of uh, rehabilitation so in their gradual walks, what we have observed is that they were stalking and uh, started pursuing prey. They were interacting with uh, different uh, species. Uh, the species that were uh, that they made uh, predation attempts were mostly langurs, uh, jungle fowl. Uh, even a feral dog was poached, so, uh, was predated. So we uh, put up all the records uh, that they were doing, and we. Uh, also documented the entire process. What we have observed is that they are more active at night than during the day, obviously. Uh, they, but one of the striking features is that they spend most of their time on ground. Uh, and they were uh, also, uh, we thought that they were highly arboreal, but they uh, mostly spend their time on the ground. Uh, they are fairly comfortable in, uh, you know, climbing trees, and they were alert for any sounds. Uh, so I would like to show you a video of uh, how the acclimatization phase went. Uh, our major apprehension was whether they will be able to kill a prey, pursue a prey, kill a prey, possess a prey and uh, whether they will be able to fend for themselves against large predators. So uh, I'll, I'll just share a video uh, when, uh, of, of acclimatization phases when they were making, we were using different species of um, uh, live prey in domestication to test their skills. So this, is, this video is about that. Audible.
Dr. Bhaskar, we cannot hear the audience. If you just like to, you know, just give a hear the audience. If you just like to, you know, just give a small comment at the end about the entire process. OK, so um, uh, what we did is uh, we documented each and every events uh, during the rehabilitation process so that even if we fail or success, we can have. Um, uh, we can uh, draw lessons from that experiment. So this was basically uh, exposing these uh, clouded leopards into some uh, species in domestication for honing hunting skills. And we obviously used uh, country chickens as as the first and foremost uh, uh, choice. So here uh, uh, we are trying to depict that you know that uh, play behavior when they are first exposed to any uh, prey was noticed, but later. Uh, they were able to hunt. They were able to possess the prey, and uh, you know they uh, they took all the prey, whatever uh, they had made a kill, uh, to a treetop and ate there. So these are some of some of the natural behaviors that we have observed uh, during the acclimatization phases, which uh, made us uh, think that you know we can probably go for the next phase of uh, rehabilitation. That is, uh, we will put uh, radio transmitters on radio collars on them and then start monitoring their behavior in the wild. So uh, uh, we started putting radio collars at the age of 13 to 14 months, uh, you know, about about five to six months of uh, acclimatization phases. So this this. Uh, actually depicts the entire process of uh, rehabilitation that we followed. So they were uh, admitted uh, at the age of two weeks, roughly. Then for the next two months, we uh, nursed them. We weaned them at the age of two months, about two months or so. Then they were moved to the acclimatization site, release site uh, at the age of five to seven months. And then uh, their uh, regular uh, the walking that is uh, the acclimatization walks inside the release uh, site uh, started. We uh, shifted uh, these acclimatization walks towards the evening and very early in the morning, probably uh, about a crepuscular uh, time frame, which is uh, which is uh, natural for uh, for this species. And then. Uh, at the end of the acclimatization phase, when they are able to hunt, when they are able to defend uh, themselves, we collared them and uh, we release them uh, at, after collaring. So uh, as soon as we collared them, we stopped all supplementary uh, food. They initially they traveled the long distances. Both of them were together. But we could collect only 60 days of uh, post release data uh, from their collars. We found that both the collars have dropped off prematurely. There was a, there was a drop off device which was uh, put on the collar so that they don't choke uh, uh, when they grow, when their neck guts grow. But unfortunately, that uh, there was a technical error in the collars and they drop off uh, prematurely. Uh, we used only VHF collar because of budgetary uh, reasons, uh, but uh, we would be happy to do a satellite collar if we find if we uh, if we attempt any further uh, rehabilitation of such species. We continue to collect evidences of uh, their presence through pug marks, cats. Uh, one of the other thing that we could have done is uh, collect their DNA uh, and then uh, try to match with the uh, scats. Uh, that would have given us an evidence of their survival. So at this point of time, what happened is uh, uh, there was a social unrest again happened in that area. So we had to withdraw. The entire team had to withdraw from the forest site and uh, for next one year. There was nobody allowed uh, inside the forest. There were anti incumbency operations uh, happening in the forest areas. So during during uh, this period, we had no idea uh, whether they survived or whether they were poached or whether they were killed. So uh, right after one year, when the um, when some some normalcy uh, returned to that area, we were approached by the uh, National Geographic uh, to 
to go on a mission, whether we'll be able to you know, get any signs or traces of these clouded leopards uh, in, in, in the wild. So that is when we um, started looking for those signs again. Uh, we were interviewing various people also, including people from Bhutan. There were uh, camera trapped uh, studies in Bhutan, which uh, uh, captured some clouded leopards. So, uh, uh, our uh, the first uh, clouded leopard uh, rehabilitation attempt we concluded with this, uh, with some lessons that we have learned so far is uh, we may adopt this method for uh, future uh, future rehabilitation processes. Uh, of assisted release method that we can use uh, for uh, clouded leopard rehabilitation with some modifications, of course. So uh, the advantage of clouded leopard is that they are not uh, known to be a conflict prone species, other, uh, unlike the common leopards. Obviously, when we put such a lot of effort, we should also put an effort to use satellite colors so that there is no data gap between you know, release and, uh, and during post release monitoring, which is uh, very essential and critical in such uh, rehabilitation process. And also scatter analysis, which is a uh, relatively uh, cheaper method of, of, uh, uh, of uh, monitoring whether your individuals have survived or how, how they are, their ranges by simply collecting scats and, you know, matching the DNA. So with that, I would like to conclude my uh, uh, presentation on the experiences of clouded leopards. So. So this was basically. Uh, a documentary that was made by the uh, National Geographic that was telecasted in uh, National Geographic. It's titled uh, Return of the Clouded Leopards. So what we achieved from this uh, experience is that uh, the area where we did the rehabilitation was a very lesser known uh, reserve forest, which is uh, which is a pristine habitat for wildlife. Contiguity of uh, with Bhutan is there. So it's about 800 square kilometers of uh, nice forest habitat. So by doing this uh, rehabilitation, we caught the attention of policymakers and uh, forest officials, and uh, we started doing a flora and fauna survey in this that area for uh, legal upgradation of the entire area into a national park. So we uh, we uh, were uh, fighting for it for last uh, six and a half seven years. So finally, in the year 2021. This entire area of 450, 430 square kilometer has been uh, has been upgraded as as a national park by the name of uh, Raimona National Park. So we are really very happy that you know although our post release monitoring with these two cubs were not uh, highly successful, but uh, we were able to save 430 square kilometer of forest area because of these two individuals, which caught the attention of uh, the policymakers and uh, community at large. And uh, we are very happy that uh, the area Raimana National Park has been uh, declared. And this area is a very potential area for uh, species like clouded leopards and also other long ranging species, which is uh, which are migratory like uh, elephants tigers and uh, especially the golden langur, which is a critical habitat for uh, this species in Ripu. So, uh, so, so with this uh, two individuals, uh, you know, if we can save some of these pristine habitats, then rehabilitation is, is worth, uh, is that what uh, we all feel. So thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to, to share my, uh, share my uh, experience. Uh, thank you, Central Zoo Authority. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhaskar, for sharing your experience with the rescue and rehabilitation of the clouded leopard. That is a species in focus for week 44. We will take question answers for this session at the end. Uh, so you can stop sharing your screen.
Uh, we now move on to the section on the zoo. So we have with us Mr. Venkateshwar, who is the director of the Sifai Jala Zoological Park. Uh, Mr. Venkat is an Indian Forest Service officer of the 2019 batch and apart from being the director of the zoo, he also holds the additional charge of being the wildlife warden of the Sifai Jala Wildlife Sanctuary. He's a forester by training and will speak to us today more on the zoo in focus. So over to you, sir. I will share the presentation for you. Uh, shall I try to share the presentation? Sure, sir. Right. If you'd like to, yes, you can go ahead. So I have shared it, uh, but it's not visible here also. I For you, yes. I put it. Uh, it's not visible here. I think so. There's a network uh, issue. I'll I'll do the sharing for you. I think that'd be better. Okay. Is that fine, sir? Yeah. Okay. Ah, sure, sure. Fine. Is this visible right now to you? Yes, it's visible. Right. Please. So thank you, Arnadi, and thank you, Baskar, sir. Um, so, myself, Venkateshwaran, I have a 19 batch. Am I audible? Uh, madam, yes, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, you, are yes you are audible. Thank you. So, myself, Venkateshwaran, I have a 19 batch. Um, I have joined the service on um, August 2021. And uh, Director Sipagira Ju and Wildlife Warden Sipagira Ju Wildlife Sanctuary as my first posting. So, as a new recruit to the service, um, I'm so lucky that I got the opportunity to uh, um, work in the area of conservation, especially captive conservation and even parallelly the um, in-situ conservation. Um, the, I have seen the both in-situ and in-situ conservation in Sipajala as such, the complex. Uh, so now I'll present about the Sipajala Geological Park. Um, I will share the experiences of the short period of myself as a director and both as wildlife warden with respect to cloud and leopard. So uh, next slide, ma'am. So uh, the about zoo, uh, Sipajala Geological Park is in uh, Sipajala district and Tripura. Tripura has eight districts. Sipajala is one of them. Uh, it is operated by as chief secretary government of Tripura. It's under forest department control. Um, we have the master plan period. The master plan period is from 2012 to 12, 13 to 2021 to 22. Uh, the GPS reading. Uh, next slide. So the term Sipai Yala, uh, yeah, though um, uh, down south from uh, uh, my uh, uh, the country. Uh, so Sipai Yala means what? The first uh, the inquisitive experience was like the, the term Sipai Yala. The Sipai means the soldiers of the then Maharaja Tripura, they used to camp near the, the marshland of the, the here. So the, the term uh, became the place of the, uh, the name of the place, uh, Sipai Jala. So this is how the Sipai Jala came. So next slide. The timeline of the uh, Jews, um, before 1972, there was, uh, it was a reserve forest of the uh, Sipai Jala area. It's an 18 square kilometer area. It's a, fragmented area in the Sipajala district, uh, it's 18 square kilometer right there, where uh, there is a um, incident of encro encroachment started. So 1972, they uh, it was called as a Sipajala biological complex. So the board, uh, the department uh, team, they uh, they got the uh, six pairs of spotted deer from uh, Alipurju, Kolkata, and they kept it as initially as deer park. So 1972, it started as a small deer park. And the history of our June 1994, uh, the um, acquisition uh, happened and it uh, it is 100 rhino from Assam. Up to 1994 to 2005, there was no exchange program due to the, uh, the situation of the state. 2006, what happened? 
we uh, the arrival of one pair of Beng uh, bengal tiger from chadbir zoo chandigarh was the uh, acquisition uh, one 2007 what happened uh, so uh, the member security cct visited uh, sipaji zoo and they decided um, so the 16 hectare area of the our zoo our zoo is in 68 hectare out of that 16 hectare can be in a for a conservation breeding program so the conservation breeding program of four threatened species started first is cloudal leopard pigtail maca uh, uh, paris leaf monkey and ventura 2000 uh, when the 2007 the initiation started 2010 as a program the conservation center started ma'am next so this is the inauguration stone of uh, uh, the inauguration stone in 1972 by the then uh, forest minister uh, next slide so this is the history now what our uh, zoo has present conditions uh, since 1972 so it's a 50 years of establishment of sipaji zoo uh, 2022 uh, also coincidence the 50 statehood of tripura so uh, sipaji zoo celebrates uh, both uh, st uh, statehood day and sipaji um, inauguration day on 21st january 2022 next slide so the what is the uniqueness of zoo this um, is one of the zoo uh, zoos in india where uh, sanctuary national park and zoo are in a perfect harmony so like it's a 18 square kilometer uh, sanctuary out of that 5 kilometer uh, 5 square kilometer is a cloudal leopard national park and um, 68 hectare is a zoo so the zoo spreads over 68 hectare in the dry deciduous and semi evergreen forest with a gentle undulating track uh, currently, the zoo houses um, 46 species of indigenous and exotic wild animals. Next slide. Man. So, uh, the 46 species, uh, out of the 46 species, most of the species are uh, um, native to the northeastern part of India uh, and Tripura, such as Binturang, Paris Reef, Pictet, Makak, like this. The animals are housed in both open motor enclosure open top enclosure and other type of conventional enclosures we have still have some of the old caged enclosures which are constructed around uh, 2000s uh, we are in in the process of maintenance of the enclosure we we are even increasing the height of the enclosure uh, to accommodate the uh, specific behavior of the animals um, our zoo consists of five sections first main section second primate section third aviary section fourth reptile section and deer park so next one. So um, so before uh, starting conservation breeding program, um, I like to add on the what are the uh, current activities we are doing in the zoo. One of the activities is the um, the security of the zoo. So security of the zoo currently we have a disaster management plan, a security plan, and a mechanism of our security audit. Uh, what happens uh, there are the, some chances or incidents of animal ex escape or um, uh, except during the uh, off season or um, uh, closing day uh, it happened so we have we have developed a mechanism um, we have developed the mechanism and uh, so to how the um, situation can be handled we have a dedicated team uh, comprising chairman uh, uh, director as a chairman so one of the uh, thing uh, second uh, the staffing pattern is zoo uh, has um, the operator of the zoo is a uh, chief secretary controlled by the uh, forest department and the director uh, in charge. Uh, we have one curator, one veterinary officer, um, biologist for the conservation breeding program, um, and one curator. So this is the thing. Um, the animal collection plan of our zoo is based upon the um, ecosystem of the area. So mostly the collection plans are related to um, uh, tropical and uh, uh, dry and uh, moist deciduous forest collection plants. So most of the arboreal uh, species are there. Um, for every species, we are giving a species species specific uh, enrichment. Both they, either it may be a behavioral enrichment um, or um, as cater to the any specific animal needs or any seasons particularly, providing food in a 
specified niche kind of um, habitat we are trying to give in this we also look upon the researches in the zoo um, in the research in the zoo what happened um, we have successfully bred the first time record of um, indian flap shed turtle in zoo um, there are uh, 12 uh, eggs in a clutch it, uh, it was there and successfully 10 were um, bred uh, uh, the uh, young ones were uh, carefully uh, raised and there are other breedings of uh, slow lorries hand hand bill hand bill paid hand bill uh, and um, jackal and paris leaf monkey pigtail leaf macaw there are the um, examples of uh, breeding program in research um, we are actually um, looking upon this particularly clouder leopard if we take um, we are looking upon the cannibalism in the uh, clouder leopard uh, the two captive cannibalism um so then um, the breeding beha- breeding behavior of the um, cloud and leopard so this is with respect to um, research and um, other activities um the next to that sanitation and hygiene hygiene so sanitation we have the proper plan for um, solid waste management disposal and um, how to uh, utilize the biodegradable waste such as leaf litter as our um, um 60 percentage of our zoo uh, have uh, forest only that 20 percentage are, are only enclosures 60 percentage are forest where the amount of leaf litter we collect are so high and uh, the management of leaf litter um, plus in addition to uh, the biodegradable waste we collected from the uh, enclosures all we are uh, actually developing a um, vermicomposting unit and how to utilize that um biodegradable waste in the zoos these are the other points currently and the what are the um, animal acquisition is in uh, our uh, uh, pipeline or a white tiger a wild dog from um, tirupati zoo and we are developing um, we are construct newly constructing uh, three more enclosures one is reptile house because um, the area in uh, northeastern india is and uh, the herpetofauna uh, diversity is very high in the northeastern india that too in, even in sipajala wildlife sanctuary also so it will be have the the model uh, reptile uh, enclosure in northeastern india second thing um, we are also developing fishing cat uh, enclosure and we are constructing um, himalayan bear enclosures these are the new enclosures we are developing um the one thing is the zoo's master plan period it changed on 2022 march so we are um, in the, the that is our first master plan of our zoo so this master plan upcoming master plan we have a um, very well um, uh, vision and uh, what to do to create a master plan and accommodate uh, such animal collection plan in the upcoming years so this is about the zoo's next about the conservation breeding so conservation breeding program um, in our zoo four species as I, as i said one is cloud leopard pirate leaf monkey and pigtail macaw and bintula uh, next time so cloud leopard uh, in cbc as um, uh, as baskar sir said uh, sir said uh, um, it is one of the um, large sized felid uh, sir Uh, we are in the opinion that it is only one, uh, one uh, medium sized felid in india so uh, that is a medium sized felid uh, we uh, will have a further discussion on that um, males weighing from 16 to 18 kg and females weighing from 11 to 13 kg currently in the zoo um, they are mostly uh, solitary uh, solitary and predominantly nocturnal animal as such the we have the currently seven specimen in the conservation breeding program and two specimen in uh, on display zoo so four is to three ratio four male uh, three female um yeah, the iucn status is vulnerable next slide so next is about um, pirate leaf monkey um that is called um, uh, spectacle leaf monkey um it's mostly arboreal it feeds on tender leaves um the yeah, spicula sanctuary have a natural population of pirate leaf monkey and though in small numbers um, uh, 
uh, it's mostly in uh, evergreen deciduous for uh, primary and secondary forest there no? uh, price leaf monkey is diurnal and lives in a social group um, uh, its iusian status is endangered and next one. next is pigtail maca uh, pigtail maca our uh, tripura has one of seven primates in tripura uh, most number of primates in a small state uh, among the primates, um, the pigtail macaque, Paris leaf monkey, and slow releases are facing um, a, a danger. So, therefore, the 2007 itself, the CZD decided its um, conservation breeding is a need of the harbor. So, they developed the program also. So, pigtail macaque is characterized by the short uh, pigtail uh, um, with the tip, particularly resting, resting on the rung. So feeds on local fruits, tender leaves, and sometimes insects and birds' eggs. It's a diurnal and predominantly a terrestrial animal. We have the total uh, 19 uh, species animals. Um, 18, uh, 5, 8, 5, and 6 are the ratio. Their, their Iusian status is vulnerable. Uh, next one. Uh, Binturong. Uh, Binturong, um, uh, currently we have only two individuals are there. Um, it's a medium-sized omnivores and nocturnal species. It's arboreal, um, though, uh, as, as I said, it's also mostly we see in the land uh, also. Um, the their IUCN status is vulnerable. Um, currently, we we have only two uh, binturong, and um, the, the binturong sighting in India or northeastern, especially northeastern um, India, are, um, as far as my knowledge, um, it's not there uh, quite a decade. Um, so it's essential that um, the species is conserved and um, we are in the process of developing a proper protocol. Um, so this is about a conservation breeding program and our SIPA geological park. Um, thank you, CZA. Um, thank you, Tripura. So uh, this is about uh, what are the activities. We have 68 percentage of areas natural vegetation and uh, education programs are as per the um, um, recognition of Jew rules 2009 and we can um, run the slides as i said uh, conservation breeding program disaster management strategy uh, next one Jew animal medicine and health necessity Jew come feed center so we are uh, as we said um, the feed are uh, specifically to individual animals uh, we cater them and uh, we are not even uh, storing the feeds in our uh, stores uh, cold storage um, in case of we for any other um, uh, non vegetarian item um, uh, next one yes one next one uh, next one So our uh, zoo keepers, animal zoo animal keepers and supporting staff. Um, uh, as of now, uh, the, our zoo has uh, FFWs as zoo keepers. Uh, currently, 50 uh, uh, zoo keepers are there, including um, uh, office and, and zoo. Uh, mostly, they are more than 20 years uh, in the field of zoo management, and they particularly know about the animals. And uh, for the, the uh, service of 20 years, are much helpful uh, now and for the conservation of the animals. We are also developing a best zookeeper of the year or best zookeeper of the month and how to keep themselves motivated. Uh, there are our programs. Um, we are giving um, what are the, uh, their special requirements such as cycles, uh, their educational plans, and the, we are providing the supports. Thank you. Next. Next one. Next slide. Ah. So, as I said, the revision of uh, uh, master plan is in um, process. Uh, so, we'll come with the, uh, the unique master plan, which uh, includes all aspects of uh, captive conservation uh, of animals, especially the animals in India and uh, northeastern India. Thank you. Next slide. This is our approved layout plan. That's it. We'll close it. 
Great. Thank you so much, sir, for, you know, the brief overview of the zoo and the activities that you do along with, you know, the plans that are forward. So we now move on to the question and answer session for today's talk. So doc, we'll take question, uh, questions for the species section first. So Dr. Bhaskar, are you there with us? Yes. Okay, so, um, so the first question for you is that uh, the clouded leopards are known to have the largest canines in the wildcat family. How is this useful to the species? Is and is there any evolutionary significance to this? Um, <laughs> um, I think there is uh, there is still a debate. I recently went through a very interesting article whether it's a large cat or a small cat. So I think uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the hunting pattern and the habitat it uh, it lives in it is uh, thick canopy always in semi evergreen and evergreen forest. So. Uh, it stalks uh, the prey from the treetop and you know the hunting they don't they don't actually pursue a prey and then kill it so that uh, i think may be uh, an evolutionary uh, uh, advantage uh, for this species and uh, its uh, prehensile tail again is, is uh, also helping in its uh, hunting so since it has adapted to such kind of habitat uh, and very interestingly, also, I mean, all the cloud leopard pictures in uh, camera traps, you will see them on the ground. Whereas uh, the common uh, belief is that uh, it's a highly arboreal uh, cat. Uh, even in our in our case, uh, the four cloud leopards that we uh, raised and that we released, uh, they always hunted on ground. And uh, so, I mean, I think it's it's still it's still uh, very premature for the for part of me to make any conclusion, but I think a great deal of uh, uh, scientific knowledge uh, we still don't have to to uh, to conclude on any any uh, uh, unlike the other uh, uh, cat species that we have. We have a lot of information on them, but for clouded leopards, uh, it's very scanty. And uh, Sepai Jala Jew is uh, very fortunate to have them and bred them. That is extraordinary work that they are doing. And it's a great platform for uh, young scientists and uh, researchers for, for studying the species. Right, sir. And so the second question for you is that uh, how do you decipher or estimate at what age the relocation of the animals should be done to the soft release sites? As like considering we know Maybe we have limited knowledge on the species biology. But how do you estimate that? Well, uh, the basic thing that we wanted is that the least amount of habituation uh, to the keepers, basically. So uh, ideally, we wanted to move them as soon as they are weaned, but they were very small. I mean, they were hardly about four or four and a half kgs. So uh, we wanted to minimize the habituation and uh, give it, give them the opportunity to interact more with the natural environment rather than the keepers and the handlers. So we decided uh, uh, on the fact that you know uh, what is the correct size that we wanted to you know uh, take them to the forest area. That was our first experience. So obviously we may be totally wrong, but as soon as uh, they are weaned, ideally if they can be shifted. The habituation and dependence on the part of foster parents will be greatly reduced because that is considered a great disadvantage for uh, animals uh, for rehabilitation. Right, sir. Uh, the next question for you is that in the 60 day tracking period that you have, did you see them coming back to the site that they were raised in? Twice. Twice okay. they came back at night. Yes. Two All days right. they came back at night. Okay, and then coming to the, with this, you come to the last question for you, which is that the clouded leopard is known like means what is generally known as you also mentioned that it is comfortable in arboreal habitats, especially with the dexterous paws and its specialized foot pad for gripping branches. Your so your talk said that they spent a large proportion of time on the ground. Could you elaborate a bit more on this? Mm. 
Well, that's the observation. That's uh, that's what we saw. I mean, uh, although they spent uh, the during the day, they were, you know, they can climb any a tree of any gut. They're, they're excellent climbers, but they during the day they spend most of the time on the uh, higher canopies, tree branches. But uh, when they are active, like in the crepuscular period or maybe in the at night also, uh, they were mostly seen on the ground. So that's an I observation. Think. Okay, all right, sir. So, so I think those were the um, questions for you. Uh, we now move on to questions for the zoo. So, Mr. Ma Ma I have a question for uh, Doctor, sir. Yes, sure, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, so thank you for your effort in the um, conservation, cloud level conservation, and uh, your uh, socially appreciation on Sipajala Zoo. This is with respect to um, you have taken the um, cow bond uh, two after two weeks. Uh, now we have the question whether. Um, when the, um, the mother abandoned the cub on, on the day of birth itself. So whether is it possible to take care uh, in case of lion or um, other animals, there is a, a study or there is a um, history of uh, that carrying. Um, so whether we can able to take care of the abandoned one day abandoned cub, uh, is it possible? Well, if they don't have any access to colostrum, uh, I think they, they you need to you need to uh, give them uh, feline colostrum replacers. And these days we uh, we use the human infant formulas, but these days you get a lot of uh, feline replacers. Like KML is one, which is which we are currently using. So apart from that, you need to have uh, some amount of um, you know feline antibodies, uh, feline colostrum replacers, which are available in the market. I think it is worth a try uh, to save uh, such individuals which are discarded in uh, captivity. So, of course, you can obviously you can make a try. Yes. The reason for the question itself, uh, the incidence of cannibalism in the Feli Feli family is high. In case of even a lion or even leopard, cat, um, even in snow leopard, uh, cloud leopard also, we were on the apprehension that so when uh, birth occurs. Uh, so the mother may or uh, eat the cubs. Whether you have heard of any incident of cannibalism in the um, cloud level? Uh, uh, obviously, it's not in the wild. I'm sure. Uh, in captivity, of course, uh, there are so many stressors in captivity which uh, may trigger cannibalism. That's what the literature says. So uh, very many zoos actually, especially those uh, zoos which are having uh, species like uh, snow leopards, if they are breeding, they they try to separate the cubs uh, on the day day of uh, birth itself. So that's a precautionary measure. But you know, natural mother is always good. You know, uh, minimal human intervention is always good. Uh, but uh, given the given the fact that you know they are uh, you know highly uh, endangered species so you need to take uh, care of them 24/7 uh, during at least during birth this is also in addition to this um, uh, i heard from my since it's a 3 3 months period only i heard from biologist in experience that the cloud leopards are uh, monogamy that they pair with the single uh, partner so they won't pair with the other uh, uh, another if the partner died uh, some other thing so is it true or what, what is your knowledge on uh, this aspect? Uh, sorry, I I don't have much uh, yeah much information about that. Um, sorry, if if it is if it is observed in your zoo, that will be a that will be a very good observation actually. Okay, uh, we are currently observing on this aspect. Yes, thank you, yes, That will be a that will be a good information for the scientific community. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, uh, so now we'd move on to questions for the zoo. So, Mr. Venkat, the first question for you is that in your zoo, what are the conservation? Are there any conservation species that are prioritized for conservation? And what is your outreach plan that is there to spread awareness about the unique habitat and you know the species in general? In the zoo, we have uh, the species identified for conservation. Uh, so, there are four uh, species as I said: turtle, leopard, uh, Irish leaf monkey. Uh, Pigtail maka and bintu. Right. So, is there any like is there any outreach activity that is planned around you know to 
promulgate you know awareness we, we have our species own outreach that, activity yes. we have our own outreach activity um, um it's a we have though we don't have a zoo education officer in our zoo um we have the dedicated staffs here uh, so the staffs mostly focuses on the schools um in uh, nearby uh, districts uh, mostly sipajala district and um, agatala west tripura so um, this is schools and uh, uh, colleges uh, the second thing also we focuses on uh, we we in collaboration with the other ngos in uh, tripura um, we uh, occasionally um, spend, uh, spend the time with the uh, outside the zoo area and the knowledge imparting process we are doing all right sir and uh, so the next question for you is that the clouded leopard is a rare and elusive cat any special attention is paid by the zoo while you know any special features are you you know done any special enrichment activities or anything are done for the species you know if, especially if you're displaying them so, with respect to clouded leopard clouded leopard is uh, one of the rare animals we have in india um, the uh, the current management practice is based on our history so we have the uh, zoo keepers so those who are, those are 20 years in the services of uh, zoo management especially as a zoo keepers so they have the um, uh, in uh, the experience and knowledge on uh, the, uh, the breeding of uh, zoo uh, the breeding of cloud and leopard um, the special enrichment practices are mostly arboreal enrichments we give and uh, field uh, enrichment the current practice is um, we uh, uh, keep together the uh, male and female only during the breeding season and off breeding season we segregate them and we segregate we have separate chambers uh, enclosure for uh, male and female uh, and we are monitoring the, uh, the breeding season is and we are monitoring the animals using cctv also um, we hope uh, the positive result we will achieve all right so i think those were the questions for you um with this we come to an end to our 44th know your species know your zoo talk so on behalf of the central zoo authority i would like to thank both dr bhaskar and to you mr venkat venkat for joy for taking time out of his schedule and joining us for this talk i would also like to thank the audience for being with us throughout and you know and and like and you know being with a patient throughout any glitch that happened um I would also like to inform them that uh, we will be back next week on Wednesday with the week 45 species, which is the pygmy hog and the zoo, which is the Sam State Zoo come bot uh, botanical garden. So please do tune in for that talk as well. And Safajala will continue their outreach activities through the week. So do follow social media pages to know more on what they have planned. Uh, thank you so much once again to everyone. Namaskar. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sivati.